Right, hello everyone and welcome to this special video podcast or vlog, whatever it is we're calling it, um, as part of the Council for British Archaeology um, Festival of British Archaeology, um, which is a digital week, a special digital week. It's been postponed and whatnot part as a result of COVID-19 and, um, and lockdowns and restrictions. But myself and Gareth Owen, who's here as well. Hello Gareth, hello, you right? Yeah. Hi there, yep. Um, we're going to do a special video um, for you all today to go through some of our online um, archives, some of our available resources. So while you're at home and you've got a bit more time on your hands, um, you can explore it a bit more. And we thought it's quite relevant as part of this digital week being run by the Council for British Archaeology. Um, so we're going to go through a few different things leaning largely on the New Forest Knowledge website. Um, and go through some other bits and bobs that you might want to explore and perhaps talk about how we can transfer it into your walks and things like that. So the best starting place is, a bit like Blue Peter, here's one I made earlier. Oh, there we are. <laughs> um, so Gareth, talk us through what we're looking at on the screen right now. So this is the New Forest Knowledge website. So this is a, an online digital archive of uh, as much as we can cram together uh, about the New Forest. Uh, it's in conjunction with the New Forest Heritage Centre in Lyndhurst um, and uh, it has a, a raft of information about the, the New Forest, its history and its heritage uh, for people to access uh, while at home. And if you have digital connection, you can obviously access it while you're out walking in the forest. That's right. And we, we have done a previous video right at the start of lockdown, which shows this map in action. So if you haven't seen it yet, do go on to the New Forest National Parks YouTube channel. It will be one of the more recently uploaded videos. And um, this explains how this map in particular works. So we've got the whole website, which we're going to look at a bit more. But we're just going to use this area that you can see on the map own as our case study. And um, this particular area, what we've got up on, if we choose our layers, we've got the scheduled monuments and we've got the modern map, national mapping layer turned on um, and to give you an idea of where we are this is Hampton Ridge across here um, or sort of underneath Pittswood enclosure um, and we've got a series of blue what are classed as modern features and if we click on that central bit of that those concentric circles we get the Boeing range of Ashley Walk. Um, do you want to give us a bit of background on Ashley Walk Gareth? So yeah, so Ashley Walk was uh, it's about five thousand acres of uh, forest area that was uh, requisitioned during the Second World War uh, for use as a bombing range. Um, there was an awful lot of um, um, uh, disagreement about it being used as a bombing range, um, but eventually the uh, the the MOD took took it over. They completely fenced the entire area and then spent a considerable amount of time making sure all livestock, uh, ponies, uh, cows, etc., etc., were cleared from the area uh, and the the fence established. Uh, apparently, from some of the oral histories we have, the fence was great at keeping out ponies, cattle, pigs, and that kind of stuff. It wasn't very good at keeping out six year old boys um, who would uh, uh, raid into the area to to look for for uh, frat. Uh, fragmentary uh, devices and all that kind of stuff to add to their collection but what we've got here is is actually walk so it was a, a bombing range and um, was used for um, testing everything that would be dropped from uh, British RAF aircraft except live incendiary devices uh, they would uh, drop inert but nothing live due to the potential fire risk we've got the main sort of bullseye um, there in the in the main area there and, and that's basically think about it as a bullseye target how close can you get to the central bu bullseye for checking and evaluating targeting um, and so on You've then got um, just at about um, seven o'clock going towards the bullseye. You've got a long line target there um, and just pointing. Yeah, brilliant, Lawrence. That's the one. So that's the line target that was used for aircraft uh, practicing their runs against things like railways and roads and those kinds of things, linear targets. And then dotted around the place, just to the right of the bullseye, you've got a sort of an area um, enclosed in a sort of a... Um, 
uh, lower right hand corner that's it Lawrence just there so that's a, what's called a fragmentation target so that was used for testing ordnance that would fragment when it landed and they'd put all sorts of targets so uh, body targets vehicle targets and as the ordnance landed they would then record how well it fragmented and how how much damage it did and then the other fragment area is just at the bottom there by the end of the line target and, and this one was testing a sort of uh, enemy defenses so they have some some gun emplacements they have some other defenses etc that they would then test our target our ordnance against um, enemy uh, targets and there's a classic story about there being um some american planes were given to the british to use and the british forces hated them so they parked them all there and tried to blow them up <laughs> um, which is just classic until of course until of course of course the the americans visited at which point they had to quickly hide them all away um, <laughs> glue them back and, together <laughs> that's it that's it and there's other targets there's mm. the ship target there's then uh, the wall target, which was used for the bouncing bombs, Barnes-Wallace bouncing bombs, um, and a number of other illuminating targets and other bits like that. So it's quite an extensive area. Um, Post-war, it was then cleared up, um, the fence taken down, um, and was returned uh, for, for commoning. Um, and it actually is now one of the most tranquil parts of the New Forest, which is a real sort of contrast to what was one of the loudest mm -hmm. and most destructive parts of the forest. That's right. So, I mean, as you say, Gareth, it's, it's a huge area and hugely diverse in terms of its content. And the whilst the National Mapping is great at identifying some of these features, so we got the bombing target there. I think if I were to click on the line target, hopefully it would tell you that it's the line um, target. Perhaps it doesn't. But it, that, that sort of highlights the, the perhaps the limitations of the map mode. But what we'd like to do is show you how you can get a bit more out of the website. So if you were to go to the, back, the top here and click into the, the search en engine um, or the search bar at the top, Ashley Walk Bombing Range, what we'd get is a series of different articles and one of those which would come up is the Ashley Walk Bombing Range Overview Tile. And um, there's just loads of great content on in here. We just wanted to really share with everyone the variety of content because some people might learn in different ways. You also might have different um, disabilities. So there's there's things in there for people with who are perhaps are visually impaired as well as have hearing difficulties because there's um, there's written descriptions as well as um, audio uh, narratives. Um, but to start with, with all these pages, it's worth just clicking on the tile the tile images. And this is this is actually an image you produced, Gareth, isn't it? So, yeah, so this is one that we produced looking at all that we knew about the site, all that we had captured through the LIDAR, through ground survey, as well as then previous publications, etc. So this is this is a map that you can download uh, via the site. You can save it as an image, print it out, um, and uh, if you're that inclined, you can then go out and take it as you go through the site and find, you know, all the gate entrances on the perimeter fencing and all the other features that are there. Yeah, that's right. And it's worth saying a lot of this doesn't survive today, but it's it's a good idea of where they might have been. It gives you an idea of a bit of a phenomenological approach to the landscape, if, if you will. But uh, it's always good starting with these images because you can scroll through and there, there's always variety of different contexts. So we've got historic aerial photographs. This is pre the lifting of that central bombing target concrete. Mm -hmm. so that's that's not there anymore. That was removed in 2010, 2011. It's yeah, fairly recently it's removed. You can see in the sort of top, top area of that, you got uh, the quite large cross and that's the end of the line target um, as well as then a numerous other targets mm. that are identified mm. there um, and uh, you can see what the site looks like today we'll come back to this particular feature in the landscape um, as well as some of the um, the the munitions they were using at the time surviving infrastructure this is the illuminated target um, and the arrow pointing to that again we'll come back to that and some reconstruction so there's plenty there to give you an idea of oh, I don't know what's happened there um, what what's going on um, but there's also plenty of text plenty of background text that you can read and learn about as well as associated articles and again we'll come back to this area in a second but I just wanted to talk about these bits and what we also do the New Forest National Park as hopefully you're seeing whilst watching this video has a great YouTube channel and um, as part of that there's loads of different content and so you don't necessarily have to look at it all on our web on the New Forest Knowledge website but you can also explore loads of different ones 
on the YouTube channel. But this one's the, the knowledge website's quite handy because it, it sort of associates the video videos with with appropriate content. And the first one that might be worth checking out is, is one. Of, this is one of many New Forest history hits that have been produced by uh, some geezer called James Brown. I've never heard of him before, but um, he he's produced loads of great videos across the national park. And for those of you that just want a nice introduction to this particular. Um, Second World War installation and this part of the forest, it's a great start. Um, and then if you if you're not up for that so much, you can take a lovely drone tour just below this, where there's um, written descriptions um, underneath there that that explains what it is that you're looking at. And again, there's plenty of infrastructure about the site. So we've got Fragmentation Hut just appearing there. If we skip on, this is that arrow that we mentioned. Um, so there's loads of cool um, content to consume there. Um, and so as I say, this is the overview one, and we're just using Ashley Walker as our ex example. So lots of other sites, lots of other areas where we produce this sort of content and connections. Um, but the next thing that's important or that's nice to look at is this um, associated links and articles. And the one I'm going to just skip to is this um, submarine pen link just here. So hopefully this will load up just fine. Um, and again, we have another really rich, really cool interactive page. Uh, Gareth, do you, again, do you want to just give us a quick overview as to what the submarine pen, or perhaps it might have a different name, is? <laughs> so th this feature is known locally as the sub pen or submarine pen. It is a huge mound in the landscape. I mean, it's 40 foot square uh, in plan and stands about eight to nine feet, uh, 12 feet high. Um, and it started life as uh, a, an experiment on air raid shelters that's what it was originally so they they very very carefully monitored how they constructed it the reinforced steel that they used the concrete mixing the drying time and so on and they also then tested how wide um, the shelter the, the gaps could be so there are four tunnels going through it think about it visually as sort of a, um, a motorway tunnel so there are four lanes going through of different widths um, and th when they constructed it um, as I said they used a variety of different concrete mixes different reinforcement and so on and in fact lined it inside to sort of hide the concrete and, and then they tried to blow it up. Um, they they failed miserably at landing ordnance on it um, from British aircraft. The, the sighting devices weren't good enough at the time of uh, its original construction and so they ended up having to blow some holes in the top of it place enemy bombs in those craters on top of it and explode those as if they were bomb craters. You can see in the image that's on the screen now, you can see the craters in the top of it. Um, the closest one came was, was one of those smaller ones to the side of it. And the end result was that the construction of air raid shelters being used was, was perfectly adequate. The most dangerous and hazardous thing they discovered was actually lining the air raid shelters, putting a sort of a false roof in, because that would fall in with, with the, the, the explosion. And so that's why bomb shelters um, that survive today are, are not lined or fitted out in any any way inside. They then tried to demolish it and, and failed miserably and so left it. We then move right towards the towards the end of the war and uh, the Nazis were producing um, the V1 and the V2 rockets and the, the doodle bugs and so on um, and we needed a way of penetrating into the ground quite some distance to blow stuff up and so we created what's called the tall boy which was a, a sort of a 12, 15,000 pound bomb, but it wasn't big enough. And so we eventually came up with this. This is the Grand Slam. This image here is of the Grand Slam, which was the largest ordnance ever dropped by the British forces during the Second World War. And the very first one was dropped here at Ashley Walk. This is the image of it actually dropping. It was released over Falding Bridge with the flight path um, and it hit literally a couple of metres away from the target and lifted the entire target up by three feet. Um, so you can see the very large crater there. 
uh, is just one of these Grand Slam explosions. And the other smaller uh, explosions you see around there are Tall Boy and other testings. But because the crews were told that, hey, you know, we've got this mock-up submarine pen um, they were using here. So sort of a, a, one of the submarine pens that the Germans had on the French coast. Um, uh, you know, people thought it was a submarine. It was a mock-up submarine mm -hmm. pen. And so that that connection between submarine pen is how it gets its name. But originally it was used for, for like I said, for air raid uh, testing. It's funny how oral history can change uh, change an understanding or the interpretation of a site, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. But what what what's great about this page as well is that there's some really good... Um, other bits of interpretation so again we've got videos and this is actually gareth is a dap hand at recreating um archaeological sites um in in 3d um format so this is one that here's one he made earlier as part of the second world war project but there's some video that talks through the construction and, and of this site um all the way from the the sort of the initial um infrastructure and the 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 lining of the concrete to to the finishing of that site itself again that's available on our youtube channel um also in the past we've had a geophysics survey done by wessex archaeology and there's a great um video again from the national park youtube channel that would allow you to understand what geophysics were done um there's a report online for this and um, if you want to see some examples of some of the data you can even see it in the top images so this is this shows the empty areas in the uh in the voids that gareth mentioned, mentioned almost the motorway um tunnels within the within the mound that still survive today but the other really cool thing that this this particular page brings us on to is our link to Sketchfab. And Sketchfab is uh, an online resource, a hosting um, website that allows us to upload some of our 3D models for people to explore for themselves. So as this is loading up, this is Gareth's model that you just saw a video of, but you're actually able to explore it and manipulate it for yourself. So you can see how big the, the structure was compared to that individual. And there's some of the bomb bomb testing impact sites there that Gareth mentioned um, and it is totally worth just clicking on this link um, on the top of the uh, the model itself because what it will do is take you to that model on Sketchfab but you can scroll down and click on new forest arch uh, logo over here and it will take you to our Sketchfab web page or, or hosting page and there's loads of other cool models on here so there's this Gareth's reconstruction of a um, Roman uh, what is that that's a pottery reconstruction or uh, pottery kiln reconstruction pottery kiln um, yeah. we've got yeah. structure for motion of second world war structures graves um carter stone there um, the cooking oven at her spit and then stuff we've been doing dro with drones as well so this is um here this is uh, key haven salt marshes i think um or high lee sultans and as it, when it loads up in a second you'll see there are points of interest that you can see where the sultans were in that image you can see what 3d um, earthworks still survive um, hopefully this will come through in a second typically we're... i think sketchfab has been a great little uh, tool for us to allow us to, to get these kind of three-dimensional models um, we've been able to use photography and, and using that mapping it into to landscapes so that we can then look at a landscape in a wider scale um, and as Lawrence was saying you know that your information points here that you can zoom into with additional information um, and we're, we're always sort of paying attention to these and taking on board thoughts and comments you know to update relevant bits as, as we come across them and find them but you can go from sort of huge landscapes all the way down to to you know even the smallest uh, pots and, and those kinds of things um, so it's it's a great tool this Sketchfab uh, and we we have quite good fun making some 3d models uh, and, and photogrammetry and so on onto it. i'm going to leave some leave some uh, potential excitement for that one there's two very good ones of the leap remains now and the the leap as they would have been during the um, hard constructions and, and whatnot so i recommend exploring both of those but there's loads of cool 3d bits and bobs and i, I think that's what we wanted to highlight there's, there's it's well worth a um a investigation and a search um but hopefully 
that's that's given you a bit of a taste for some of the content, particularly around this particular Second World War site um, that is available on there. And it doesn't just have to be Second World War. And the, re the reason I included these scheduled monuments in this area because it allows you to look at some of the more nationally important sites that are found there and in particular we've got the things like over here which are the Roman pottery kilns um, in in the north of the forest and these are in Slowden in Amberwood um, and they even go there are even a few in Pittswoods so and again we've got this use and this reuse and manipulation of the landscape over thousands of years in the new forest we are a cultural landscape where whilst everyone says we're beautifully natural and untouched a lot of it is being created by humans in influence, even if it's just the ponies being put there by William the Conqueror. But the, these pottery kilns would have been a really big industry and they were ex excavated just over 100 years ago for the first time. And um, we've actually created, if you would search Durden, for example, on the New Forest Knowledge website, this is a chap that didn't excavate or had a collection of excavated pots that he, he donated to the British Museum. And there's a whole article on, on Durden Collection itself um, and then our work when we went to the British Museum to, to record some of these with volunteers using photographic um, 3D recording techniques. Um, and we've got a plug-in, so rather than going to Sketchfab itself, you can explore this online archive, this on online collection of accurate 3D reconstructions of these pots which are hidden away in archives in the British Museum stores which will never really be seen unless you're a researcher going to specifically look at these items so it's a really cool bit of insight access and we're hoping to develop this further um, as we get access to more collections and it's just not I mean, being able to <laughs> yeah being able to see the these models uh, it's so close up and that you can zoom in if i recall one of them you can actually even see a f thumbprint that's right on one this them. one here um, this this one in the middle the pinch beaker I, I won't spoil the surprise for people but if, if yeah, do, yeah don't spoil it. let them go find it let them find it but um yeah i just think it's it's just a great resource and you can there's there's further details and bits to be found we try and link as many things as possible there are geophysics reports of Slowden's pottery kilns there done by placement students there are local research groups of added items and if, if you compare what we've shown you today with the map video the interactive GIS video that we produced just at the beginning of lockdown there's loads of content and research that you, that you can get and understand and hopefully it can inform some of some of your walking plans going forwards I mean that that's the nice thing about it it can really help you as you explore the forest the other thing just to throw in there is that you can actually log into the site register and you can contribute uh, you, you know if you go to a site or if you have any work etc you can actually contribute to the new forest knowledge website um, submit articles works etc that uh, you may have done or you may be involved with sort of history archaeology those kind of groups but getting out walking these sites is is another great aspect and, and on, on the national park authority's website um, we've got our, our walking page that lists just you know just you know the routes that you can go and walk with information about those and we are developing these on a sort of a, 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 a on a case by case basis as we're expanding what we have to offer improving and developing them as we go forward that's right in castle hill for example lovely um uh, hill fort up here and if you were to go back onto the new forest knowledge website and turn on the prehistoric layers you could see some of the lidar some of the um, other bits and bobs to support your walk and this is a you can download this pdf or download the app and and just under make just enrich your walking um experience as well and um, but you've been working on some other walkie bits haven't you gareth so yeah so as part of a, a project funded by the, uh, the heritage lottery our, our past our future we've been developing historic routes so these are five trails that use existing rights of way and we've been able to trace the routes that are now rights of way uh, back in time some of these we've actually managed to get back to the sort of mid 1700s where you can see the lines on the maps uh, and those lines are, are, are now rights of way so from those we've then identified five locations where we think we can we've managed to put together a nice engaging uh, walk that you can go and explore some history some heritage um, and have a, a really good exploration of, of, of the forest as it were some of these um, are literally so I mean Tatchbury Tatchbury Mount is 
a lovely one in that it's right near to the Totten housing uh, estate um, and you go underneath the bypass for Totten bypass and you're straight into the new First National Park. It's one of those places that you know once you get out to it you, you sort of can forget um, uh, the hubbub of, of Totten and the busyness as it were of the bypass and you're walking through medieval landscapes Iron Age landscapes um, and it's, it's, it's really it's a lovely place to go and walk. The rights of way need improvement and work and we're working to do that but these five trails uh, give you an enhanced experience so we're putting together history, we're putting together heritage, we're even putting together f um, myths and legends and folklore um, about some of these these areas etc so that as you're going round you'll be able to read or listen to uh, audio descriptions historical information via either a, a downloaded uh, little leaflet that you can print and take with you uh, or we are now working towards actually some audio content that you might be able to listen to download it onto your phone or an mp3 player and take it with you and play it at particular points along it um, but these are work in progress the the aim is the project's due to end in december um, now with the uh, small extension due to covid um, but we're hoping that uh, people will really enjoy the, these five new trails and be really able to get out into the forest with and hopefully without the need for a car you can just get out your front door in totten and be, be walking in the new forest that's it i think um obviously things are opening up a bit and it's important to stick to government guidelines and and be sensible with your walking but obviously um exercise and getting out is also part of it so we do say be responsible with your with your approaches be responsible even being in the national park the whole th mantra of take nothing but photos and leave nothing but footprints is very much uh, an important one when working in the new forest um but yeah we, we we'd very much encourage you to make use of these resources to enhance and improve your day-to-day -day walking experiences and the only other thing we'd like to highlight is that we've got this tree graffiti citizen science project going on so the forest has got such a rich um history of humans interactions I, I mentioned it earlier there's this perceived natural landscape and it's not natural and trees give us a really nice little insight into how people have been interacting with these woodlands these whether they're ancient beech woodlands or or more recent plantations and the style at which the trees are there but um, one thing we're particularly interested in uh, is historic tree graffiti and we've got this citizen science website so if you go to newforestmpa.gov.uk forward slash tree dash graffiti a uh, bit of a mouthful but it's, it's not too bad or just google new forest tree graffiti it might be an easier one to do but uh, we've got this citizen science uh, page so there's examples of tree graffiti that you might be able to see and um, uh, instructions on what to do how to look out for it why it's important um, and then there's this citizen science form to fill in so you can activate this map don't worry too much about those bits that's just looking if you're doing it on your mobile it's a bit different but you can zoom in and um maybe not to that that particular country we might go to uh, the new forest but um you can zoom in and get a nice detailed map up and actually identify where you were on your walk so if, for example if you just headed out past uh, Lindhurst golf course into the woodlands here you know you've come up this track and you spotted some tree graffiti just there place a pin by clicking in that area upload a photo of your um, your discovery and some information about yourself and we'll include this to a database that um, is going to be made publicly available but it's also going to inform researchers and just general our understanding of people's interaction over time so well worth um, considering while you're out and about and just just hunting around see what you can find i think the uh, i think this has been hugely successful uh, the the amount of input and responses we've had we're we're, we're sort of a bit blown away by it really aren't we Lawrence? with that um, exactly i think right. the important thing to stress there is we're not in any way encouraging new graffiti um and no. so, so please don't go out and, and do any new graffiti but if you do spot anything do let us know about it it's amazing what what is out there and we're discovering uh, and it really sort of arcs back to the, you know added history and heritage to the, the new forest that's right exactly that and yeah just enhancing your experience and appreciation but I think that's about it. There's, there's loads more going on as part of the Festival for Archaeology. So the main one is much later down the line now. But in terms of this week when this video has come out and those dates that keep popping up on the screen for you there, um, do check out the Council for British Archaeology website. Maybe ignore that particular picture that's on the screen at the moment. <laughs> but um, um, 
But um, I had no idea how that's got there. Um, 11th to 19th of July, there's loads of cool stuff going on. So check out that website. Um, check out things that are going on on in on social media, and um, and there'll be loads of cool things to keep you busy. Brilliant. Yeah, it, you know, just get out there, have fun, explore it uh, online as, as it were, as we're still locked down. And then when we can, get out safe and be safe and, uh, and uh, enjoy yourselves. That's right. We look forward to seeing you all soon when we can. Right Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.